All right, first, first thing we're going to notice looking at my Kindle copy of I for Isabel is that it's an Australian um, novel and it was originally published, you'll see their copyright Amy Whitting, uh, published in 1989. Now, it was published, so that's what now about 26, 27, 28 years ago. Um, and it's an Australian novel. Now, Amy Whitting is not actually her correct and real name. It's what we call a pen name or a, a pseudonym. So her real name was, I think, Joan Fraser, and she chose to write. The name's actually significant. Um, does anyone know what witting means? Look up the word witting. Done in full awareness or consciousness. This is this is actually really significant, I think, to the message of this novel and the message of the author as a whole. That she, I think she believes that if if you're aware and conscious of your inner motivations, including the things that hold you back, you're going to be better off. And that the main character of this novel is somebody who, for much of her life, is being held back by um, stuff in her subconscious, in her, in her psychology, that she doesn't quite get. And the adoption by Joan Fraser of this name, Amy Whitting, and I think even within the A my, A, A my, my Whitting, me Whitting, A me Whitting, me Whitting, that idea that of wanting to understand yourself um, and why you do stuff. It has been, there is a um, an introduction here, which I, I think I'm, probably won't read to you, but it is actually really interesting to read and probably worth reading just to give you a bit of a feel for who Amy Whitting was. Um, she's kind of like Isabel, the character in this novel, except maybe that she's she's probably better educated, um, Joan Fraser. She, she probably did have a better education. Um, the character uh, Isabel comes from a much poorer background, I think, than um, Joan Fraser did. So it is worth reading that. It's also set in a slightly different period. In fact, the novel doesn't actually tell you when it's set. It's kind of, I think it's like that deliberately so that it can represent any time um, in some ways. Did anyone have any ideas, the four of you that actually read it, uh, when did you think it was set? The 1940s. You thought the 40s? but <laughs> Yeah, not the 70s. It's... Maybe. I think the 50s. 50s. It is the 50s, I think, and the reason that we were able to tie that down is there's some discussion of um, New South Wales um, rugby league football, which one of my students last year is was a bit of a sports buff, and he went off and he, he was able to kind of look it up, and he, he was pretty sure that from the details it was meant to be the 1950s, but I think it's left deliberately vague that it could be anywhere from the 30s, 40s, 50s. It's definitely in a period before, you know, the 60s and the 70s where society became far more liberal and, and values changed and, and there was a lot more freedom in society. And it's definitely, definitely after sort of World War I. I think Amy Whitting herself, Joan Fraser, she grew up, she was a young woman between, between the wars, I think. Um, so I don't. I think in the 50s and 40s, it's not exactly autobiographical because she was well and truly grown up in that in that time. Um, but I think it's the 50s. But yeah, I do recommend that you read read that that introduction. All right, I for Isabel. First chapter is called the birthday present. What you'll find is there's five chapters. The titles are very significant for each chapter. They're there for a reason. So. Think about what the birthday present is. And remember I said for those first three chapters, one of the big concerns is what does she learn about her life in each of these chapters? All right, the birthday present. And you'll have to excuse me if I get a bit tearful at times. A week before Isabel Callahan's ninth birthday, her mother said in a tone of mild regret, no birthday presents this year. We have to be very careful about money this year. Now, I'm just going to highlight that because it's a good quote. Every year at this time, she said this. Every year, Isabel chose not to believe it. Her mother was just saying that, she told herself, to make the present more of a surprise. Experience told her that there would be no present. As soon as they stepped out of the ferry 
onto the creaking wharf and set out for Mrs. Terry's lakeside boarding house where they spent the summer holidays. The flat reedy shore, the great Morton Bay fig, whose branches scaffolded the air of the boarding house garden. The weed bearded tennis court and the cane chairs with their faded flabby cushions all spoke to Isabel of desolate past birthdays. But she did not believe experience either. I'm going to get desolate past birthdays. And that she did not, she did not believe experience. What's that saying to us? So I'm also going to, while I'm back there, I'm also going to get experience told her that there would be no present. And I'm going to highlight it. And it's, it's interesting because you know what children are like, don't you? Because you've all, you've all been them and so have I. Children aren't terribly logical little creatures, you know, that they're not. And this is what crushes me about this chapter is that she's been treated badly for years and not given a birthday present for years. And even though she should know and she remembers that she's never had one before, there's that little hope in her heart that just it breaks my heart to think of that little hoping child who should should have already been crushed by the meanness of her mother, but still every year childishly holds out for something else. Now, remember all of the little details that make our essays look like we've read the book? Mrs. Terry's. Just things like Mrs. Terry's can be um, nice little details to chuck into your essays. And the idea is she's going to a boarding house here. We're not being told we are going to a boarding house, but we're meant to kind of pick up that she's on her way to a boarding house. And you can tell where it is because of the Moreton Bay figs. So we're in somewhere in northern New South Wales or Queensland, somewhere up warm, nowhere near here. All right, so we've got desolate past birthdays. What's desolate mean? Bleak. Thank you. Bleak, empty, sad. And she does not believe experience either, and that's that childishness in her that's, that's so tragic. Day by day she watched for a mysterious shopping trip across the lake, for in the village there was only one tiny store which served as a post office too. When no mysterious journey took place, she told herself they must have brought the present secretly from home. Even on the presentless morning, she would not give up hope entirely. All right, not give up hope entirely, but would search in drawers, behind doors, under beds, as if birthday presents were supposed to be hidden, like Easter eggs in the grass. Mrs Callahan too, kept the birthday in mind and spoke of it now and then. January, she said, is too close to Christmas for birthday presents. And later, serenely, serenely is what? Peacefully. She's almost enjoying this. She's, oh, she, January, she said, is too close to Christmas for birthday presents. And later serenely, it is vulgar to celebrate birthdays away from home. So she tells vulgar is what? Disgusting. disgusting, yeah. So she's saying it's vulgar and disgusting to celebrate birthdays away from home. What do you guys think of that? It's ridiculous. Who would ever think such a stupid... Oh, isn't that amazing? Lacking sophistication or good taste, unrefined. Make explicit and offensive reference to sex or bodily functions, coarse and rude. Characteristic of belonging to the masses. How did I get that dictionary to come up? I don't know, but I love it. It's awesome. The idea that, that it would be coarse or rude to celebrate your birthday when on holidays is just absurd. And yet... It's being told to this child who has no other world view from which to disprove it. She's growing up in this environment. Um, whenever she found a new argument against birthday presents for Isabel, a strange look of relief would appear on her face. All right, so the mum would get a look of relief every time she gets a new idea for disproving these birth, uh, for not having birthday presents. And Isabel would be forced to accept for the moment that there would be no present. Mum is getting off in some kind of weird way on this being nasty to her daughter. Well, this year she would remember. This year, one week before Margaret's birthday, she would remember to say in her ma mother's own tone, no birthday presents this year, and see what they would make of that. So Isabel's saying to herself, don't fall for that trick this year. 
you know there won't be one, don't get sucked into that thing. This year, remember. But she knew, even as she muttered bitterly to herself that she would not, rem that she would not remember. She had no grasp of the calendar yet. Holidays surprised her and the seasons were not attached to the names of months. Only Christmas could be foreseen because of the decorations and Santa Claus. And I, I love this detail. This is what I love about this writer and how she just captures, you know, you know when you're a little kid and I, I remember when I was a little kid I thought Easter came the week after Christmas. You just, you just don't have any perception of times or dates. You just get told it's your birthday and all of that sort of stuff. And there's this little, little girl and she's, this year I'm going to remember. This year I'm going to remember not to get sucked in. But she just knows she's going to forget because she's still a little, little, little girl. Um, it's very sad. It's really sad. I'm going to stop telling you how sad it is and just let you experience it. She got presents at Christmas being lucky enough to have Christmas the same day as everybody else. So... I love that. She gets presents at Christmas being lucky enough to have Christmas the same day as everyone else. Margaret's birthday, with the present, the real present wrapped in paper, was a black day for Isabel, but it always came without warning. It was not talked about beforehand like her own. So just out of the blue, it'll be Margaret's birthday and Margaret's given a present, a real present. Here it is, wrapped in paper. There we go, highlighting that. And it's a black day for Isabel because she sees her sister Margaret getting something she never gets. This year, the day before her birthday, her mother said in her real voice, now Isabel, in her real voice, I like that. Her mother has a real voice, which means she must also have voices that aren't real. Now Isabel, you are not to go about tomorrow telling people it's your birthday. Actually, I'll do her real voice. Now Isabel, you are not to go around tomorrow telling people it's your birthday. I could have died of shame last year with you running about like a little beggar telling everyone it was your birthday. We don't want any more behaviour of that kind. I'm going to highlight chunks of this because this is gold. Behaviour of that kind. Little beggar. She's a little beggar. What do beggars do? Yeah, which is what? No, they don't steal. They ask for stuff, don't they? Yeah. And over here, her mother could have died of shame. I wonder why. And you're not, a, not to go about tomorrow telling people. So she's not even allowed to mention it's her birthday. Imagine the cruelty to a small child of eight or nine years old. Last year, she had disgraced the family. That was true. See, even the fresh... That was true. So she's accepted this doctrine, this what her mother tells her is her only world at that age. So on some level, she's having to accept it. If she's told she's horrible and if she's told she's brought shame on the family, she's going to believe that until something somewhere in her life gives her a, a, some kind of something that she can base a different kind of reality off. So last year she had disgraced the family. That was true. On a giddy impulse... She had run into the garden among the deck chairs, shouting, It's my birthday! Today is my birthday! Skinny, crinkled Mr Daubeny had shouted back, Catch this then! and spun a two-shilling piece in the air. She had caught it in the lap of her skirt. She hadn't had time to begin to be clumsy, and someone else had cried out, Here's another over here! Here you are, Isabel! She had held up her skirt like a pouch and had caught all the coins spinning round and laughing and the grown-ups were laughing too as she called out, thank you very much, and ran inside with her treasure. Her mother was standing watching inside the long glass door of the bedroom. She dug her fingers into Isabel's arm and hissed, let your skirt down, let it down. She took the coins Isabel had gathered, stared at them in her hand and moaned, asking for money, asking for money. How could you shame me like this? When her father came in, her mother pointed to the money and said, she's been going around begging for money, telling everyone it's her birthday. Oh, what shall we do? Can we give it back? Isabel was sitting on the bed not allowed to go out in case she disgraced the family again and subdued because her mother was too upset even to be angry. Can you remember who gave it to you? 
She shook her head. Her father said, sounding tired, I don't think we'd better say any more about it. You mustn't ask people for money, you know, Isabel. Last year the day had been terrible, and the worst thing about it was that the lovely moment of the spinning coins and the laughing voices had turned out to be bad behaviour. All right, I want to go back and get lots of quotes out of that, okay, because it's really, it's very juicy. All right, so what do we get? Tell me what you got out of that moment. So Isabel, she runs out that joyful, childlike, normal. Yeah. Isn't it normal to behave like that on your birthday? My kids are so excited when it's their birthday. It's a beautiful thing. So she's behaving, she's behaving normally on and what you've got to get to is there's two birthdays in this chapter there's the birthday that's happening yeah and she's talking about the one from the year before so she's approaching her ninth birthday she's remembering remembering her eighth birthday the year before and how that ended up so when she gets the coins that's her eighth birthday and you know there's this beautiful moment where you get the contrast between the mother who's horrible and normal adults who aren't. Normal adults can experience and joy with children and, and like to be kind to them and see their joy and, and they get pleasure from that. There's something really sick about not getting pleasure from seeing the joy of a child, isn't there? Um, so she has a really normal moment with the spinning of the coins, which is a beautiful moment for her, which is then completely destroyed by her mother, who says what? Shame. Shame. You're shaming the family. You're disgracing the family. You hey, cats hiss. Yeah, yeah, hissed. It's a hor it's an angry, really aggressive, angry sound. Yeah. So she runs out saying, "It's my birthday. It's my birthday," and she does. She thanks them. So see, she's thanked them. She's not an impolite child, and I think you'll find pretty soon the next scene comes along, and she's accused of being impolite and not thanking people, but she does have good manners um, and she ran inside with her treasure and you could keep treasure because it's, you don't need to look up the definition of it. Um, her mother was standing watching inside the long, she dug her fingers into Isabel's arm. So that's that kind of almost aggressive, violent sort of thing. She hissed at her and hissing is done quietly too, isn't it? When you hiss, she's not shouting at her. Why isn't she shouting at her, do you think? Thank you. She doesn't want the... Even if her mother, even if Isabel doesn't realise her mother's a cow, her mother knows that the way she treats her daughter is not socially acceptable. So she keeps it quiet. But Isabel's unaware of that. So the mum's having a go at her, but she's doing it like this because she wouldn't want the other adults to see it because deep down she knows it's wrong or unacceptable. So she hissed at her. She took the coins Isabel had gathered, stared at them in her hand and moaned, oh, asking for money. How could you shame me like this? So you could just keep words like sh shame, which is painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by consciousness of wrong or foolish behaviour, loss of esteem or respect or dishonour. So they're all good things to bear in mind for what shame actually means. And then the, what's Dad do when he comes in? Is he supportive of Mum or does he stand up for Isabel? That's right. He's he's only got, he's only got her version, and it's a it's a truncated version of the story. Truncated means to, to shorten something. He's also not asking any questions, is he? And I think that's that's also important. He he's not saying, "Hang on a second, this is this poor kid's birthday. She's in trouble on her birthday." Like, don't you? I don't know about you guys, but I would do anything to avoid growling at my kids on their birthday. And are your parents the same? You know, it's almost like on your birthday, they, they you just want for your kid to have a beautiful day. Yeah, so Dad, I think the, the key is, is that Dad is not standing up for her. Last year, the day had been terrible. And the worst thing about it was that it was at the lovely moment of the spinning coins and the laughing voices had turned out to be bad behaviour. So the moment's been destroyed. So she can't even enjoy that memory. Thinking about it, she wondered what had become of the money, but that didn't matter very much. The money had been the money had been real treasure when it was flying through the air. After that, it, it had only been a cause of shame. 
So it's all about the ruination of, of joy. She forgot about last year when the meaning of her mother's words sank in, that she was not to tell, not to tell anyone that her, it was her birthday. She was by nature timid, anxious only to know what was required of her so as to keep out of trouble. Now, we're going to keep that because this is about the kind of kid she is. She's by nature timid. Timid is what? Shy and not a bit hesitant and a little bit uncertain about themselves and, and so forth. And she's anxious to know what's required of her. So she wants to know what the rules are so she can keep out of trouble. So if she can understand what the rules are, she'll follow them. She doesn't want to be in trouble. She's not naughty. She doesn't rock the boat. But she didn't think she could do that. It was like being asked to walk into a crack in the wall. It was just not possible. So the birthday is so exciting, she's not going to be able to prevent herself from talking about it. Now she was sure there would be no present. Tomorrow morning she would not look, and that was a step towards the kind of person she longed to be but did not have the words to describe, someone safe behind a wall of her own building. This is also really good. So she's making these resolutions that she's going to be tough. This year she's going to be tough. She's not going to show them she cares about this birthday present. And, but she knows she's not going to be able to do it. She feels she's weak, but she, there, she has in her head an idea of a kind of person she wants to be, and it's somebody who's safe behind a wall of her own building. Tell me what you think that means. Yep. So what kind of wall are we talking about? What's it look like? Hey? Metaphorical wall? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Put that in your essay. That's good. She's built, she wants to build a metaphorical wall that... What kind of wall would it be, though? A metaphorical wall. The, I think, I imagine it's a bit like, imagine some, like, tough teenager who had had all of this stuff that's gone on in their life and, you know, it's been all really, really tough and they get a bit of an attitude and they don't want anyone to see that they care about anything and everything's just, no, 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 no. So that's building a wall that... People can't see that, that you're hurt or can be hurt. So she'd like to be that kind of person that people can't see her vulnerability. But not to tell, not to say just once, it's my birthday today. She thought, I shall tell the tree. So she can't, doesn't think she can do it. She saw herself hiding her face between the two sharp folds of the tree trunk and whispering, it's my birthday today and felt a thrilling pain in her tight throat as if she was reading the little match girl in the old book of fairy tales at Auntie Anne's. That, so that book, The Little Match Girl, is a sad story about a little girl who has a tough life, um, which is, is interesting because on some level I think she knows that having to tell the tree is pretty tough. That put her in a reading mood. She went into the lounge where there were bookshelves full of books for guests with a special shelf for children's books. She had read that out long ago. She, by that she means she'd read all the books on the children's bookshelf. She looked through it, but there was nothing new and nothing she wanted to read again. So she began to look through the other shelves. She took out a book called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, thinking that adventures could never be dull, read the first sentence, to Sherlock Holmes she is always the woman, and was disappointed. That didn't sound like the beginning of an adventure. She turned to the next story, A Case of Identity. My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes, as we sat on either side of the fire in his lodgings at Baker Street, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive of the things which are really mere commonplaces of existence. If we could fly out of that window, hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs and peep in at the queer things which are going on. Birthdays, injustices, parents all vanished. Now, that this novel, the main character loves to read and reading and books become an escape and a sanctuary, sanctuary for her from the horrible life that she's living. And she, she goes into these books and they give her joy and pleasure and they allow her to escape. So that quote, birthdays, injustices, parents all vanished, 
is a great one to talk, to talk about the importance of the escapism of reading for her. But the quote itself is also interesting, I think, because, and in talking about things, strange things that go on in the world, in society, if we could fly out that window hand in hand, hover over this great city and gently remove the roofs and peep in at the queer things which are going on. So in a sense, this novel peeps in at the queer things. Queer is strange, at the strange things that are going on inside the roof of this house. So she's also from literature. She also absorbs knowledge too. So it, it gives her an escape but it also gives her a window and an access to perspectives on the world that are not solely coming from her mother's evil, um, evil, don't use the word evil in your essays, I've told you that. <laughs> Stop it, doc. Whoops, I'll have to edit that out because it's got my name in it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so her, it gives her a window into another source of knowledge. And as we grow up as children, from children to adults, that's exactly what happens to us is we are gradually exposed to more and more perspectives on the world. So we learn from more people than our parents. We learn from our friends. We learn from what we see on TV. We learn from, you know, um, books and, and movies and all sorts of things. We pick up values from lots and lots of different places. So birthdays, injustices, parents all vanished. She sat on the floor reading till the noise of cups and saucers in the kitchen warned her that the grown-ups would be coming in for afternoon tea. Then she went to the little room where she and Margaret slept next to their parents' bedroom. It was too hot there, but if she went outside to the cool shade of the fig tree, Caroline and Joanne Mansell would come asking her to play with them. Or well, Margaret would want her to go for a swim. Besides, it wasn't hot in Baker Street. Baker Street's where Sherlock Holmes lives. So... She's saying her room's really hot, but she's going there because she can hide from people and read. And she's going to be, it's just a clever little way of saying it's not hot in Baker Street. She'll be able to forget the heat once she gets into the book. She's reading Sherlock Holmes. She's reading Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. What a lucky thing that she had found this new place in time to spend the birthday there. Presents didn't matter so much if life had these enchanting surprises that were free to everyone. So reading is an enchanting surprise. Um, and she says here yeah, that presence didn't matter so much if life had these enchanting surprises that were free to everyone. And she means by that that she, even she, even she can read books. And the books were on shelves just to be picked up. She read without stirring till Margaret came in and said, Mum says you to wash your hands before dinner. Dinner was the main meal at home they called tea. Mrs Callaghan pronounced the word with a conscious elegance which Margaret imitated, maddening Isabel, who was about to hiss tea, but recollected herself and said, Can I have the light on for a while tonight? We're not allowed to read in bed. Oh, go on, don't be mean. It's different on holidays. It's only at home that we aren't allowed to read in bed. You ask them then. Isabel hid the book under her pillow. Ho, ho, Margaret spoke with adult poise, then relented with adult satisfaction. Oh, all right, so long as you put it out before they come to bed. They can see the light under the door, you know. And go and wash your hands, because I was told to tell you. So these parents are so weird that they don't let their daughters read in bed. Weird. But to them, it's normal. And also, the, the adult poise... Um, and also the tea, that mentioning of the um, tea being called dinner, it's this, they're on holidays and so they're trying to act posh and they want people to respect them. So what they call, let's go home for tea, suddenly it gets called dinner like that and it, it's driving Isabel, Isabel a bit nutty. Um, but that's what they're talking about there, that they're, they're kind of on their best behaviour at this boarding house. Isabel went quietly because of Margaret's kindness about the light. The birthday still cast its shadow in spite of Holmes and Watson. So she's got rid of it a bit, but it's still casting its shadow in spite of the books. While she ate her tea, she was thinking how wonderful it would be if beside her bed in the morning she found a huge box wrapped in paper 
with a big bow and a card that said, Happy Birthday, Isabel. She would try to lift it, but it would be too heavy. So she would rip away the paper and lift the lid, and there would be the complete works of Arthur Conan Doyle. Books and books and books. Now, he wrote Sherlock Holmes. That's why they're mentioning him. It was a lovely dream, but then she woke up to reality and felt the worse for it. So again, that idea that dreams, if dreams are going to be not fulfilled, if they're going to be crushed, actually it's better not to have them. So she woke up to reality and felt the worse for it. So don't dream, that means. It was a lovely dream, but then she woke up and felt terrible. After tea, she had to play snap with Margaret and the Mansell girls while she thought about Holmes and Watson and longed to go to bed and read. Bedtime came at last and, she, and was wonderful. Margaret went to sleep straight away, so she put her clothes on the floor in front of the crack at the bottom of the door and read until she was nearly asleep and could just stay awake long enough to put out the light. Great little detail, that one, the, the love of reading, how she jams her clothes under the crack of the door so that her parents going to bed won't see that she's still reading. She, what My kids do that. Now they've got Kindles. They pull the doona cover over there. I put their lights out and they pull the doona cover over and they've still got their Kindle under the covers reading. I pretend I don't notice. She woke early and thought at once with tightened heart. Don't look. It isn't any use. I like that tightened heart as well. Um, don't look, it isn't any use. Then she remembered the tree ceremony, which she had better perform before anyone else was up. Remember, she was not allowed to tell anyone it's her birthday, but she thinks that's too hard, so she's decided she's going to go and tell the tree. Quickly, she put on yesterday's clothes and ran outside to the fig tree, but when she reached it, she saw a pair of legs dangling, and there was Caroline sitting on a low branch looking down at her. You're up early. Isabel wanted to say, so are you, but other words were too pressing on her tongue. What other words are they? It's my birthday. She wants to say it. She said instead, can I tell you a secret? You're not to tell anyone else. Caroline's eyes lit with interest. Sure, go on. It's my birthday today. That's not secret. Caroline was disappointed and resentful. Birthdays aren't secrets, not ever. And of course they're not secrets. It's absurd that, that this is being, she's being asked to do this. Well, mine is, how do you know anyhow? Plenty of people might have secret birthdays and you don't know because they are secret. I don't see why. Caroline buttoned her lips and shook her head firmly so that her fat, fair plait swung wide. Well, people have secret weddings, I know that much. In books they have them often. And if you were a baby and you weren't supposed to be born, so you were smuggled away to somebody else, then nobody would know your birthday. So it would be a secret, wouldn't it? What about Moses? I bet nobody knew his birthday. Now, there's no... In this novel, um, the author doesn't, I don't think, unless anyone else picked up on it, doesn't ever really give a reason for why Isabel's mother treats her so badly. Um, and I would have thought if she was the oldest child that maybe she'd been forced to get married because she was pregnant or something like that. Um, but given that she's the second child, I don't think that that, that can be the answer. But I, it is a really strange thing that Isabel says there about, you know, if you weren't supposed to be born and, you know, you had to be taken in by another family. I wonder whether it's, you know, it, it, it just makes me think about what could have happened in this family to make the mother take such a dislike to the second child. You know, what were, what were the circumstances of her having the baby, you know, um, all of that sort of stuff. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer, but it's interesting. Caroline didn't intend to tangle with Moses. She knew less about the content of books than Isabel, but she knew the world better. She said with authority, somebody always knows. Then she dropped down from the branch, saying, I think I'll go and see if Joanne, Joanne's awake. See you later, alligator. Sauntering across the grass, she turned her head and called recklessly loud, many happy returns. So I like that idea of she knew the world better. So um, Isabel, as she grows up, 
starts to meet other people outside of the family and those people, they know the world better than her and she's going to learn from them. Even little things like birthdays aren't meant to be secrets. That's a clue for her that some of the stuff her parents are dumping on her is their problem, not hers, um, and it's really important for her. Isabel would have done better to tell the tree. What does that mean? If she told the tree, the tree wouldn't go around telling everybody, but now she's told Caroline. Caroline is just going to blab and she's going to get in trouble. She went back to fetch her book, having another celebration in mind, a mean private one. I like that too. We'll go back and we'll collect that. She's going to have a mean private um, celebration. Uh, she was going to hide from her parents until breakfast time so that, that if they wanted to wish her a happy birthday, they could do it in front of everyone. So what, why, why is that a mean private celebration? What's she doing there? And also that kind of making sure that it's done in public too, dragging. I think there's a little element of her wanting to show up that her parents aren't behaving as they should. Um, and I like that idea of the mean... You know, when people are treated badly, sometimes they respond by wanting to pay back. You know, you can become mean because you're treated mean, I think. And later on in the novel, Isabel does become mean. Remember, when we get to the telephone box in Chapter 5, she becomes very mean. And I wonder whether her mother, who's mean, maybe she's also had some meanness um, happen in her life. Although that's outside of the text, it's not there. Okay, uh, she's going to hide from her parents so that if they wanted to, they had to wish her a happy birthday. They would have to do it in front of everyone. Or if they liked, they could forget it. All the better if they did. She hated the way they searched her face for signs of sulking so that they could laugh and say, what a long face on your birthday. Frown on your birthday, frown all year, knowing perfectly well that she was miserable because she hadn't got a present. So they, they're being cruel. There's a nastiness in them. And she doesn't want them to see her pain. She felt sure that they would be ashamed not to mention her birthday at all. There was going to be lit a little fun in this if it worked. So she's getting that sense of other people's opinions of her parents not necessarily being good. Margaret had not stirred. Isabel took her book and crept out. With unusual forethought, she washed her face and hands and even combed her hair so that there wouldn't be any trouble about that. What does she mean by that? Yeah. You, you know, sometimes when you're worried you're going to get in trouble for something, you make sure that you do everything perfectly so that there's no opportunity for someone to find fault and pick on you about something else, if you know what I mean. Do you ever do that? I know I do. If, I, if I'm worried about getting in trouble over something, I'll make sure I get everything done perfectly so that they can't quite find the crack and, and you know, get to me. Um so she's making sure she does all of this stuff, which she wouldn't normally necessarily do correctly. Um, then she went to her hidey hole, the big old chair on the back veranda. The chair wasn't meant for sitting on. It faced the wall. There was stuffing coming out of it that prickled against her legs, and it was lopsided because one leg was broken. But she could manage to curl up in it and be out of sight. She read until breakfast bell sounded, then waited a little longer before she sneaked through the kitchen. That was forbidden ground, but Mrs. Terry and Irene, the waitress, were too busy to notice her. The Mansells, father and mother and Caroline and Joanne, were there already, and Miss Hallwood and old Mrs. Hallwood were coming in. So she was sitting calmly eating her wheat bix under powerful protection when her parents arrived. Powerful protection. I highlighted that with my other class. Why would I highlight that? What point might I make with it? Yep. It is. It is really strange. Good point. Yeah, it's this idea that she's actually, her parents will behave themselves when they're in public, so she feels she's protected by just being in the presence of strangers. Well, there you are, said her mother, in a gentle, reasonable tone. Wherever have you been? Just outside. Old Mr Welsh coming in said, with her head in a book, I suppose. It's quite a bookworm you have there, Mrs Callahan. Dangerous ground. So she's worried about the turn this conversation's taking because I think the reading is for her, it's her only pleasure and the last thing she wants is for her parents to clamp down on it and see it as some way that they can get at her. What are you reading now, Isabel? asked Miss Hallwood, who was a teacher in real life. Oh dear, the quicksand itself. So now she's really worried that she's going to get found out and, and lose her books. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. 
Goodness me, said Mrs. Holwood, that's a difficult book for a little girl. With thin saintliness, Mrs. Callahan said, You know you're not allowed to take grown-up books without permission. Oh, Mrs. Callahan said Mrs. Miss Hallwood, there is really nothing wrong with Sherlock Holmes. A lot more moral than Biggles, said Mr. Welsh. Besides, went on Mrs. Hallwood, it would, it would be a shame to check her when she is so advanced. Check, when you check someone, you hold them back. It would be a shame to hold her back when she's so advanced. I only wish some of my pupils read so well. So she's being praised by these other people. Your poor sister is outside looking for you, Isabel, her mother said. You'd better go and find her. Isabel got up to go, but Margaret coming through the door said easily, I thought you must be in here, and took her place. Do you understand all the words, Isabel? Miss Hallwood asked. I guess some of them, drunk on approval, she spoke with too much pride. I keep that. She loves getting this attention from, from these people. That isn't a bad way of learning, but it's a good idea to look up one or two in the dictionary. Don't look up so many that you get bored with reading. That would be a pity. I couldn't ever get bored with reading. Just nice little quote there for if you want to talk about her love of reading. You could say that she said that she could never get bored with reading. You're a lucky girl then. I'm, I'm lucky too in the same way. The only reason I'd like to be your age again is to have all the wonderful books to read for the first time. How old is she, Mrs. Hallwood, asked Mrs. Callahan. Uh-oh, how do you like that, Mrs. Callahan? Isabel saw the red rising in her mother's face and dropped her eyes demurely. Do you know how to drop your eyes demurely? Like that. <laughs> you like that? She's, 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 she's timid, but she's not, she's got a little bit of an edge to her that she's quite enjoying seeing her mother's discomfort here. And she likes the fact that the birthday is going to come out and her mum's going to look like a cow for not having done anything about it. So she, um, and that's that, oh, how do you like that, Mrs Callahan? Um, Isabel saw the red rising in her mother's face, dropped her eyes demurely. Margaret was staring with a puzzled look at her mother. Her father was eating, paying no attention. Mrs Callahan said quietly, she is nine, so she does know it's her birthday. Remarkably advanced for her age, said Mrs Holwood. Isabel was living in two worlds. What a great quote. You'll be able to use that to talk about the difference between a mother's real voice and the public persona that she puts on and the living in two worlds. Miss Hallwood's, where she belonged and things were solid and predictable, and the other one, where she was exulting and making her mother uncomfortable. So she's, her other world, she, one world, world she's actually trying to pay out on her mum. That was a great pleasure, but it was like gobbling sweets. She expected some sickness from it. And you could keep, even keep great pleasure. So she does, she enjoys, she's enjoying this making her mum feel uncomfortable. Um, meanwhile, there was the world of Sherlock Holmes, which was better than both of them. So there's a third world, actually, the world of literature. She said, may I be excused, please, and hurried back to her chair. She fished out the book from under the seat and went back to Baker Street. Now, Baker Street, does anyone know? What's Baker Street? Yeah, it's where Sherlock Holmes lives. So she actually feels like she's going into the story, almost like going to another place. She read until she had finished the book. Then she went to the lounge to change it for further adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which she had seen on the shelf beside it. On the way back, she met her mother. I was looking for you, Isabel. I want you to go down to the shop and buy me a small writing pad. She handed her a two-shilling piece and then added, smiling kindly, you may keep the change because it's your birthday. Well, her mother had wriggled her way out of that one, but not for nothing. So she's got that through shaming her in front of the people. So I like that, wriggled her way out. I'm going to keep that. Of that one, but not for nothing. Isabel took the coin and set off for the shop. She knew it was no fortune, yet there might be enough of it left to buy something that could be called a birthday present. In the shop, she asked for the smallest writing pad and put the coin on the counter. That will be one and eleven pence halfpenny, a halfpenny, said the shopkeeper. To her fallen face, he said, it's all right, girlie, you've got enough. You even get change, see? He handed her the cack-coloured insult. 
she took it and the writing and the writing pad and plunged out. Now let's look at that and analyze that for a second. Now does anyone understand pre-decimal currency? A shilling is it has it's made up of pence. And do you know how many pence there are in a shilling? Twelve. Oh, all it's like a dozen eggs. They seem to work in twelves in the olden days. So you get a twelve. I think you had 12 pence in a shilling and then 12 shillings in a pound. Her mum's given her one shilling. She's gone to the shop. She puts down a shilling. She gets 11. It costs 11 pence and a half penny. How much change is she getting? Half penny, which isn't going to buy anything. All right. And so that's why she's, I'm not getting anything. And then the cac coloured insult. What's cac? Yeah, it's like poo, cat-coloured insult, the poo-coloured insult. It's because the coin is brown. It's a little brown halfpenny coin, little one. Um, so that's an insult because it's the mother's, she's got her again. This is deliberate. She thinks immediately, she's got me. She's doing this on purpose. And she, when she goes out the door, she plunges out the door. She's feeling really unhappy. You couldn't make yourself safe, no matter how you tried. So she tried to make herself safe from her mother's attacks. You, and I'll get that. You couldn't make yourself safe, no matter how hard you tried. They could always surprise you. Now, go back. Why can they surprise her? Why can't she make herself safe? And why can they always surprise her? Why, why, are, these, why are these adults able to surprise her, no matter what tricks she comes up with to get get her way yeah because they're older because they're grown-ups and she's only nine years old and she's trying to be clever and 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 win but she's never going to win because they're adults and they know more about the world than she does and they're able to pay out on her in ways that she can't anticipate um so she, it's it's difficult for her they could always surprise you she wanted to hurl the coin into the water but she knew she mustn't express any feeling at all it's better for her if she doesn't react. And remember that wall she puts up? It's if You you know when bullies pick on kids? You know when a bully picks on, on you? You know what you should do? Yeah, don't react. The more you build a wall. <laughs> it's, it's that idea that bullies, bullies pick on people because they like, they, they want to be cruel to them and they get their jollies from seeing that person unhappy. And so the best thing to do with a bully as most people work out pretty early on, is to show, is to project the image, no matter, no matter how you feel underneath, project the image that it doesn't hurt because the bully will get sick of you and go and pick on somebody else, which is really sad actually, isn't it? <laughs> but it's true. They will, they, will, they will not get their jollies from picking on someone who doesn't react um, and they'll turn their attention to somebody else. So she's worked this out at nine, that if she doesn't, re you know, her best, her best, solution to her mother's attacks is to make it seem like it, it it's not hurting when it actually is so here she goes blessed mary virgin mother make me not cry i don't want to cry blessed mary mother of god baby jesus i don't want to cry help me blessed mary virgin mother and baby jesus so she's turning to religion here and this idea of their uh, people use people do believe in god many people do and they certainly did in this this day and age, and, and little children especially, she believes God can help her through this. So if you want to talk about her turning to religion as well as to books, this is an example of that. If once she started to cry, she wouldn't be able to stop. I won't cry, I won't cry. Help me, blessed Mary. So she's reaching out for help to, to God. At last the prayer made a patch of candlelit calm in her mind. I like that, the prayer. Made, oh, beautiful writing. Um she slowed and steadied the need to cry having passed. So she's talked herself down, been able to talk herself down into calm through, through um, praying. When she got back, the bedroom was empty. Perhaps Blessed Mary had seen, seen to it that she didn't have to meet her mother straight away. Isabel found the special attention comforting. She murmured, thank you, Blessed Mary, left the writing pad and took her book. As for the repulsive halfpenny, she wanted to do something wicked and outrageous with it, but she lacked knowledge of the, of the suitable curse. She dropped it into one of the drawers. If they asked her what she had done with it, she would say she had put it in the poor box on the shop, shop counter. Um, she went into the small room to leave her book on the bed. Margaret wasn't there. 
The lunch bell must have gone while she was out. She hurried to the dining room and sure enough everyone else was at the table. Only her place was empty. Except for a little parcel wrapped in pink tissue paper and tied with gold string. Keeping her eyes on it, she sat down warily. Mr Mansell said at length, Aren't you going to open your parcel, Isabel? A harsh, loud voice came out of her mouth, saying, Is that thing mine? She heard her mother draw in a long breath of rage and wondered why, but she did not look away from the little parcel. I'm just going to keep that long breath of rage. So the mother, the mother is just not coping at all with this. And also, just Mr Mansell, this present comes from Mr Mansell. It's one of those little details that can slip into essays to show text knowledge. Yes, said Mr Mansell in a funny, slow, clear voice, like a teacher giving dictation. It is a present for you, for your birthday. So he might be putting on a little bit of a performance for her mother as well. You can imagine the conversation these parents would have been having these other people. That, what is wrong with that woman? That poor girl having a birthday and they haven't got her a present. Caroline told me that she was told not even to mention it. I can just imagine them all. So he's, he's doing his performance for them as well in his slow, clear voice. With jumping figures, she untied, unwrapped, opened a little box, pinned to a card which read on top, Elegance, and underneath fashion jewellery, there was a gold brooch shaped like a basket, an old-fashioned one with a wide brim and a curly handle. There were coloured flowers in it, three little white bells with green tips, two daffodils, a pink rose, and a blue flower with petals edged like a saw. It was beautiful. It was a present for a real girl. There you go. So a real girl. So she, this way that she's treated so poorly by her parents make her feel like she's not even a real person, not even a real little girl. And this sort of thing, this is all it takes to, to, to swap that around. Just remember that, you know, details for your essays, that it's a gold brooch from Mr Mansell. Those little details help to kind of make it seem like you, you've read the book. Um, which, of course, you have. How strange it was. Birthday after birthday, she had hoped, and at last, after she had been given, uh, after she'd given up hope, the present had come better than anything she could have imagined. She lifted it out of the box, set it on the lid, and read it like a book while she ate her lunch. Mrs Callahan had recovered her company voice. There you go, company voice. The voice that she keeps for when they're in company. How kind of you. It's only a small thing, said Mr Mansell. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Chancing on a useful phrase in a foreign language, she said graciously, she's spoilt enough already. Ah, oh, there you go. Spoilt enough already, her mother says. There was a disturbance, a kind of gust of breathing, a grown-up face level round the table. Isabel looked up and saw that all the grown-ups were turning on her mother. The same glare of indignation, except Mr Mansell, who was looking at Isabel herself with a bright, soft look that puzzled her, and her pale father, who was going steadily on with his task of cutting, chewing and swallowing. Her mother, for once, was even paler than he, so white-faced that traces of an earlier colouring showed russet in her hair and green in her eyes. She was staring at her plate, plying her knife and her fork slowly and carefully, like crutches. Isabel felt an ache of sympathy, knowing how it felt to be the last to be chosen or even left out of the game. Besides, what was wrong with what her mother had said? It sounded just like the stuff grown-ups usually talked. All right, let's decode that a little bit. It's very, very dense. Did you get it? Did you get the image in your mind of these adults sitting around, what's going on? Tell me, somebody try and explain it, what's happened. Yeah, so the, you can feel the coldness from the adults. They don't approve of the, the mother's behaviour and um, they give her... So I like that, that grown-up, this is all going on at the level of adults, and she's a nine-year-old just trying to 
just try. You know, when you're little, you don't entirely understand what adults are doing. But as you grow up, you start to pick up on more and more and more of what's going on at their level. So this is going on a gust of breathing at grown-up face level around the table. And all the grown-ups were turning on her mother because they're not cruel like she is and they don't approve of what she's done. And they're showing, they're all sharing, oh, how could you? But And Mr Mansell, he's doing, not that what they're doing, he's actually turned to her and he's giving her kindness and love, which is what she should be getting. Um, and her pale father is going steadily on with his task of cutting, chewing and swallowing. That's a great quote for Dad and how he doesn't get involved in any of this and he's just... And then even later... The mother also, she picks up on all of this. She does, she knows it's happening and she's also focusing on what she's doing and she's using her knife and fork slowly like crutches, you know. You kind of get that feeling that, you know, have you ever done that? You know, when you're really deeply uncomfortable in a conversation or a situation and you'll just start to be doing something, like maybe you'll get your phone out or, you know what I mean? And you do that. So she's using them like crutches to kind of get her through this moment, which she's feeling so uncomfortable in. Um, but I can almost see, you know, crutches, you can, I see these knife and fork like crutches. She's getting through this moment. Like you can't see this on the video. <laughs> All right. Okay. But Isabel, that's the other thing that's really amazing about this and one of the th reasons I love this kid so much is her response even to this cow is what? Hmm? How does she respond when these people pick on her mum? Ache of sympathy. She feels. She actually feels an ache of sympathy. It's not a, oh, I felt sorry for mum. It's, you know, you love your parents and when, when they're picked on by other people, you feel bad for them even when they're being horrible. So that's a really that's a sign of her, her humanity. And it's deeply sad that she is willing and prepared to love her mother. She forgot sympathy in looking at her brooch. When she'd finished eating, she put it back in its box, wrapped it, clutched it, gabbled, maybe I'd be, I'd be excused, please, and ran to her room where she sat on her bed reading and looking from time to time at the brooch, unwrapping and wrapping it carefully each time. She's absolutely delighted with this present. The sound of her mother's quick, foreboding tread made her push the box in a panic under her pillow. It's just awful. You can hear the steps coming up the... And, you know, she's thinking, this is just going to be awful. Um, now she remembered. She had been told not to tell, and she had told. She had told Caroline, who had told Mr Mansell, and retribution was coming. That's a good word, retribution. That's payback, all right? Retribution, punishment that is considered to be morally right and fully deserved. Interesting. Retribution was coming as her mother advanced with set face and luminous glare and began to slap her, muttering, don't you dare to cry, ungrateful little bitch. Don't you dare to cry, you little swine. Thankless little swine. You couldn't say thank you, couldn't even say thank you. Slap, slap. Don't open your mouth. Don't you dare to cry. So she's physically assaulting her, verbally abusing her. All of these little phrases here, this, this you know, the ungrateful little bitch, that sort of stuff, should never be said to a child um, and the slapping and sl swine are pigs so to call somebody a swine is to call them a pig it's, again it's that belittling thankless little swine and she's come up with a reason to be able to do this hasn't she what's her reason she didn't say thank you that's right yeah she hasn't hasn't remembered to say thank you there was not much to cry about for her mother's intentions were far more violent than her blows all right, here we go. Her mother's intentions were far more violent than her blows. I think Whitting is making it absolutely clear that the mother here is completely cruel and her intentions are to destroy this child. She does not want her to be happy. Her, ha her hands flapped weakly as if she was fighting against a cage of air. She straightened up and drew breath. Mr Ratton... Mr Mansell rode right across the lake to get you that brooch and you couldn't take the trouble to say thank you. It's no use going anywhere with you. You bring disgrace on us wherever you go. You bring disgrace on us. 
Uh, it's no use. Words are wasted on you, gawping there like an idiot. And she calls her an idiot. She put her hands to her head and walked out in despair. <clears throat> Isabel took the box from under the pillow, took out the brooch and looked at it a while. She rubbed her stinging legs. And her legs are stinging because I think she might have been slapped on the legs as well. Why hadn't her mother taken the brooch? It would have been so easy. Isabel could even supply the word she had dreaded to hear. Give me that. You don't deserve to have it. Come on, give it to me. Why hadn't she said them? Could it be that there were things her mother couldn't do? Now that, if you're looking for things that Isabel learns in the first chapter, I think this is one of them. There are things her mother couldn't do. Why can't she? Why doesn't she take the brooch? Yeah, exactly. She can't take it because it's been given to her by these other people. So were the coins the year before, but she got away with that. But this year it was too public and the condemnation of her behaviour. It had been a symbol of the disapproval of all the people there and so she couldn't now take it. So she's Isabel's learned that her mother has to answer to the world, really. That idea was too large to be coped with. She put it away from her, but she took the brooch and pinned it carefully to the neck of her dress. It was hers now, all right. She went and looked at it in the glass and stood admiring it. And I like that. She admires it because the coins the previous year were ruined and it became a source of shame for her. But this year, something shifted and she gets to keep the brooch and the memory of it, the beautiful brooch, is not destroyed. Instead, she understands that the problem lies with her mother's behaviour and that's the difference between the two years. Now, this last sentence, in one way or another, she would be wearing it all her life, has puzzled me for a really long time. Any ideas? Yep. And thank you for all that. Yes, that maybe that separ separation from the family a little bit, that she's going to be emerge from this family into a, a real world where she can be different to what they say she is or something like that. Thank you, because I, I'd still struggle with that and I think there's bits in this novel that we, we will struggle with um, but uh, it's one of the beauties of it.